Well, good morning, everyone. At uh, our GBC, it's not Zoom church, it's at its home church today. And I hope you're enjoying the fellowship, a bit of singing and some, uh, some praying. Now, the last time I had to speak to the camera, I was so nervous and I got all jumbled up at the start. So I've decided today that I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm just going to relax and I'm going to give you what I've got here and hopefully it'll help someone. Okay, so the topic I'm talking about today is that a growing church, and that's what we want to be, a growing church, and I'll explain that a bit more in a moment, but a growing church will be one that prays and witnesses. Now, our church, I imagine, is probably pretty strong on the praying part, but I wonder how good we are on the witness part, being out there witnessing to others. So by way of introduction to the talk, I've said that we should want our church to grow. Why? Well, not for pride, so that we can say, well, our church is growing better than yours. We've got more people coming to our church than you've got. Not for pride. And also not for our pleasure. Example, better singing. I mean, Everyone enjoys the singing more the more people we've got together and with the fantastic music team that, that we have at our church. But also, not for money. Yes, more people come, we hope we're going to get more money in because if everyone obeys God and just tithes or give what they feel that they want to give because that's what God wants, a cheerful giver. But it's not so we'll get more money and it's not so we'll get more workers. I mean, if our church grows, we're going to need more people in Sunday school. We've already been told that we need more people uh, helping uh, Angela uh, with the food. And then we've got people that um, you know, we need in the creche and so on. But we shouldn't be hoping that our church grows just so we can get more workers. But all of these things, except for the pride, are good things. They'd be nice to have those things happen, but it shouldn't be our motivation for why we're doing it. So then why? Why should we want our church to grow? Firstly, because it would mean we'd be obeying God. Remember the great commandment, the great commission. The great commission that Jesus gave to the church to go to go into our neighbourhood, to go into our city, to go into our country and go overseas. And that's why it's so good that we have Claire uh, as part of our, our church family, uh, that we can encourage her and help her as she serves overseas. So one reason we should want our church to grow and be doing everything that we can to help our church grow is because it would help us obey God. And then the second one is to see people saved. You see, we shouldn't want church growth to be about seeing people from other churches coming into our, our church. Although, thankfully, that does happen sometimes, especially in Canberra where people come from Sydney or all over Australia. They come for work. They've been going to churches, good churches. And we want to encourage them to come to our church. But that's not the church growth that we should be praying for and aiming for. Because remember what Jesus said about the Great Commission. The Great, com uh, the great Commandment. <laughs> I'm getting these two mixed up. The Great Commandment says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul and all our strength. And then he added and to love your neighbour as yourself. Are you glad that you've been saved? Are you glad that you know if you die on the way home from church or that you're going to go straight to heaven? Are you glad that you're able to enjoy a relationship with God that helps you get through the hard things that are thrown at us with a peace that other people don't have and don't understand? Now, if we enjoy those things as the family of God, and if we're going to love our neighbour as we love ourselves, 
then we should be praying and sharing with our neighbours so that they can come into the family of God. And that's the church growth that God wants us to have. He wants us to be having people being saved, finding Jesus as our motto, and then growing in their faith, finding Jesus and being able to follow Jesus. Now, that is what our church should be all about. Now, do you think that perhaps we should have happy services with joyful singing? Yes, because that helps people come in sometimes, but it also helps us feel freer to invite people to come in when we enjoy the service our, ourselves. Maybe you think we need shorter sermons. Some people might think we need longer sermons. Maybe you think we need more jokes, or sometimes people think we need less jokes. But none of these things are going to bring people into our church on their own. So I'm going to look at just two points today. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be a five-minute message, but it means that there's two main points that I've got sub-points to help you understand the main point that I want you to get, want to get across. So the first one is that the people in the early churches had motivation. They had the right motivation to get out there. If you look at, the first of all, the people believed that other people needed Jesus. Now, I've talked already about your neighbours and talked about, but what about family and friends that don't know Jesus? Churches these days, we don't like talking about hell, do we? But the Bible says it's a real place. The Bible says that if we don't know Jesus, then we're not going to be saved. But the other thing is that we can enjoy, as I've said, a relationship with God. And people in this day and age need that relationship. And so they believed that the people needed Jesus. They had Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody that you know or have met or will meet have all sinned. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Left to themselves, the wages of sin will bring death. But in Jesus, we can get the forgiveness that we need, the forgiveness and the cleansing that Jesus gives us, which then allows us to have that relationship with him. And then Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, there's that word, all. All we have gone astray. Doesn't say we've robbed banks. Doesn't say we've committed adultery. It says that we have gone astray. We have turned to the way that we want to go. I was talking to this lady this morning and trying to explain to her that God will never force her to come to faith and follow Jesus. She has to make a decision. And we need to realise that everyone has gone their own way. They choose what they want to do, their workplace, whether, who they're going to date, <coughs> excuse me, who they're going to marry. But these are all major life-changing decisions that we need to trust Jesus with. Read through the Gospels. See what Jesus said. See what Jesus did. And find out if he's someone that you can trust with your life, that you can follow the things that he has said. And finally, on this point, the point that they believed what the people needed, that they needed Jesus, is Matthew 9, 36 to 38. When he saw the crowds, Jesus, when he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless 
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest, all these people who don't know me, who don't love me, who can't have a relationship with me, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then he said, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into his harvest. And in that, par in that paragraph, we have the essence of what it is to have our church growing, to see that people need Jesus. And so we need to be praying earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. But sometimes we need to realize that we can be the answer to our own prayers. So they believed that the people needed Jesus. They also believed the teaching of Jesus. John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is teaching that he doesn't want people to be living without him. He doesn't want all of these people that are living without him to stay in that state. He wants them to come to know him and love him. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come to condemn the beggar, the thief, the prostitute, the adulterer. He didn't come to condemn them. He came in order that they might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only God, uh, Son. Now, what does that mean? As I've said already, hell is a real place. So what does condemned mean? Condemned means that they're going to be judged according to their, the sins, their, sin, their life where they haven't followed God's rule to the last point, where they haven't loved him with all their heart, soul and mind. And so they're condemned. But I want you to understand this. You look at this passage and it's not God that's condemning these people. They're condemning themselves. Because whoever believes in him is not condemned. If we choose to believe in Jesus, to trust him for our salvation, trust him as our Lord, then the Bible says we're not condemned. But if we don't believe then we're condemned already because they've not believed. Not because Jesus is condemning them, they're condemning themselves because they're not believing. So they believed the teaching of Jesus and then they believed what Jesus had done for them. Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now this is the Jewish Sanhedrin talking to Jesus' disciples after Jesus had risen, after they had the Holy Spirit. And they were out witnessing. But their court said to them that they weren't to teach at all in the name of Jesus. So Peter and John answered them, Whatever is right in the sight of God, to listen to you rather than to him, you must judge. For we, now this is talking to their, their court, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They were compelled to speak about what Jesus had done and what they'd seen him do. And we know we know what Jesus has done for us, living his perfect life. 
being prepared to go to Jerusalem when the disciples were trying to stop him. Going to the cross when he could have called down angels to save him. Suffering on the cross, even the separation from his father. But then he rose from the dead so that we have proof that we have a living saviour that, that can help us with our life between now and when we go home to heaven. But also that we have that assurance that that is our, that is our future, that we will be with him. Now, they could see what Jesus had done for them and that motivated them that they had to get out. They couldn't be stopped. So we need to have that same motivation. In Acts 4, 23 to 31, there the disciples were already being persecuted and the other followers knew that they, that they too would be persecuted. So what did they do? I guess they ran away. Perhaps they stopped preaching. Or perhaps they were taking more notice of God than human thinking. What did they do? They met together and they prayed. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. To speak your word with boldness. When do we speak about his word with boldness? While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through your name of the holy servant Jesus, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They waited till they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they were able to go out and share with boldness. What are we waiting for? The Bible teaches that when we accept the forgiveness that Jesus brings to us, we receive the Holy Spirit into our life. The Bible itself calls it being born again. Born of natural birth and born of the Spirit. And so we have no need to wait before we go out and share boldly. I guess the one thing we have to wait for, though, is to actually get together and pray first. Yes, it's good to get together and to pray for our own needs. It's good to be able to pray for those in our, our church family. It's good to pray for encouragement. But it's also necessary that we pray for specifically for the unsaved people that are in our families, the unsaved people in our friend group, the unsaved people that you'll meet in your life as you go through. And finally, in this part, they believe that all people could be saved. All people could be saved. I've heard many people say, oh, you're wasting your time with him, Bob. You won't get him to believe. And they're right. I never will. But the Holy Spirit will. And some people that I've been told were impossible are now in the family of God. Listen to Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes onto you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and to the ends of the earth. Why would Jesus tell them to go out and do something that was impossible? Why go out and share the gospel in all these places if it was impossible for the people. And Acts chapter 11 says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, travel as far as, now Jesus had said go into all the world, they travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch. And what did they do? They were spreading the word. But at this time, 
only among the Jews. But they were out there, they'd been scattered, and they're spreading the news to the Jews. But then it says in verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch. And when they went there, they began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about Jesus. The Lord's hand was on them, it says. And what happened? A great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now you think about it. This is showing that, especially to the early church, that all people can be saved. To them, the Greeks, it would have been impossible. But now I want to switch to the last point, and that is that they had the right method. We've seen they had the right motive. They wanted to go out. They needed to go out to obey Jesus. We have the same motivation. We need to go out if we're going to obey Jesus. Go out and share the gospel boldly. But they had the right method. And that's this, what I'm looking at now. First, they prayed. Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 14 and 15. So there in, in Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with the brothers. They were to go out. So what did they do? They came together and they prayed constantly as the body of Christ, as the family of God. They prayed for those who needed to be saved. Acts chapter 4. On their release, now Peter and John had been arrested for sharing their faith, picked up, put in prison, and then they were released. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, reported all the chief priests and the elders had sent to them. And if you want to read back in Acts chapter 4, they were threatened and what was going to happen to them. But verse 24 says, When they heard this, this is the people, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Verse 29, now, Lord, consider their threats against us and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Lord, we've heard what they're threatening us with, but help us get out there and share your word after they would prayed. Then, having prayed, they went out and witnessed boldly. If as a church we have prayer meetings and we come together and we pray and we say, God, please help us save people, but we never go out and share the gospel. It's not going to work. People aren't going to know that our church family is, loves them and are concerned for them and that we want them to enjoy all that we have in Jesus in their own lives. So they prayed. But then they witnessed boldly. Acts 4 again. After they prayed, the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say they raced out and started standing on street corners and, and preaching. No, it says they spoke the word of God boldly, but they prayed first, having been filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 5, we gave you strict orders, the Sanhedrin said, not to teach in this name. Yet you have, what have they done? <laughs> you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of the man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We have to obey God 
not the rules that are set up by a government that is a heathen government that's against the Christian faith. Wherever possible, we need to follow the government that's been given to us. But we follow God first. And God says, pray first. And after you've prayed, witness boldly. And lastly, on this point, Acts chapter 5, verses 40 to 42. His speech. Now, he, his, is Gamaliel who was a teacher of the law, a Jewish man in the Sanhedrin. At this point, the Sanhedrin were about to put them to death. And Gamaliel stood up and he persuaded them, the Sanhedrin. They called them the apostles in. They, he, he persuaded them not to put them to death, but to warn them again and let them go. So they called the apostles in. They had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then they let them go. Now that's the governing body is telling the disciples who have prayed and asked God to help them go boldly and share their faith not to do it again. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. <laughs> when I read that they were flogged, I thought, boy, you know, that's not too good, all right, they're not being killed. But they left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, is Jesus telling us that we need to go to the Belconnen Mall and set up a stand and, and, and preach to the people? No. You see, what they were doing was taking the opportunity that God gave them to speak to people who wanted to hear the message because they'd heard about Jesus. And what we have to do is take the opportunities that God gives us to share with people. Now, how are we going to recognise the opportunities God gives us unless we're praying for them? How are we going to know what to say and how to say it unless we're praying and asking for God's help to be in us, to give us wisdom to listen and wisdom to talk? And then, and this is very important for us as a church, everyone in the church, whether you've decided already not to go and share or whether you want to share, these early church people, they showed the love of Jesus. They showed his love to each other and the world was watching. Acts 2, 42, 46. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They came together and we've been hearing of the importance of fellowship coming together as the body of Christ and loving and helping each other in our lives. So they came together and they had fellowship. They were meeting together and breaking the bread together and praying together. And then it says everyone was filled with the awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. In the power of Jesus, with the working of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were now doing miracles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They said pro they, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and were glad with, with gladdened hearts. Now, what's God telling us? To sell our homes? To go out and to, to share what we've got? That's not what God is asking us to do today. Because we live in a completely different culture, completely different times. At the moment, we have governments that set up systems for the poor to be fed. For the poor to get clothing. I go to the Salvation Army sometimes, I go to um, Binny sometimes, and I look at the prices and think, oh, 
that's nearly the same price as a new one. But then I know from experience that if you take someone in there who has nothing and they need clothing, they give it to them. So the organisations are there. So what are we to do? We are to see our time and our money is something that belongs to God. We give it to him. We work together. As Adam said uh, back when he gave his last message, we are to be in each other's lives, encouraging each other, giving our time, giving our resources. Does everyone in our church need a lawnmower? Surely some of us could share our lawnmower with someone. That might be a help. I've got a car that I love to use for other people, taking people from the race course to different places. I've given my car to God. Well, actually, he gave it to me. But our home, we love nothing more than having people come into our home and sharing it in that way. So it's past time to finish. So here's the conclusion of the matter. A growing church, and we're a new church that needs to be growing, but we want to be growing for the right reasons. A growing church will be a group of people bound in the love of Christ with a divine compulsion to pray and witness through the word and through our word and action. For this we need specific prayer for the unsaved. And next week my message will be on praying for the unsaved, showing how we can pray specifically for our family members, for our friends, for the people in the street, the people that we find. We will need to be praying for our witness that we will have courage and wisdom to allow God to show us who to be praying and witnessing to. When was the last time you stopped and prayed God, show me someone who wants to hear your message. So, show me someone that you have prepared their hearts and minds ready for this. Lord, give me wisdom to understand and to listen to them and then wisdom to share. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have worked in our lives. Lord, everyone hearing this message has heard about you. Everyone knows that Jesus did miracles and taught teachings that can just change lives. Father, there are some of us who perhaps haven't accepted Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. And I pray that they will do that. Yes, so they can make sure that they're not condemned and they're going to go to heaven but also so they can enjoy life now with you. Lord, help us be prepared to be your people in this world, witnessing for you with our words and with our actions. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.